My dear brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you all for coming to tonight's Arbaeen uh, lecture at Al Mahdi Institute. Tonight's majlis was sponsored for the Risala Sawab of Marhum Afzal Hussein Walji, Marhumin of Ghulam Hussein Walji family, Marhumin of Fazl Hussein M.A. Fazl family. Before we begin, can we recite Surah Al Fatiha for this and all other Marhumin? Al Fatiha. Tonight's program will begin with um, recitation of the Holy Quran by Brother Muhammad Ali, Marcia, lecture by Sheikh Arif, um, followed by Matim, Ziyara, Q&A, and um, refreshment. Please can I request everyone, please can I uh, welcome um, Brother Muhammad Ali with his salawat. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Fawajada
قال فين اتبعتني فلا تسألني عن شيء حتى أحدث لك منه ذكرا فانطلقا حتى إذا ركبا في السفينة خرقها قال أخرقتها لتغرق أهلها لقد جئت شيئا إمرا قال ألم أقل إنك لن تستطيع معي صبرا قال لا تؤاخذني بما نسيت ولا ترهقني من أمري عسرا فانطلقا حتى إذا أتيا غلاما فقتلا حتى قال قتلت نفسا زكية بغير نفس لقد جئت شيئا نكرا قال ألم أقل لك إنك لن تستطيع معي صبرا قال إن سألتك عن شيء بعدها فلا تصاحبني قال إن سألتك عن شيء بعدها فلا تصاحبني قد بلغت من لدني عمرا فانطلقا حتى إذا أتيا أهل قرية استطعما أهلها فأبوا فأبوا أن يضيفوهما فوجدا فيها جدارا قال لو شئت لاتخذت عليه أجرا قال هذا فراق بيني وبينك سأنبئك بتأويل ما لم تستطع عليه صبرا صدق الله العظيم
Thank you very much, Rama, for this uh, beautiful recitation. Can I call upon Kumail Rahim for the Marcia recitation, please? Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad Sarawat. سجاد کو بے موت یہ غم مار گیا ہے سجاد کو بے موت یہ غم مار گیا ہے بے پردہ حرم ساتھ ہے بے پردہ حرم ساتھ ہے اور شام چلا ہے سجاد کو بے موت یہ غم مار گیا ہے نہ مار سکینہ کو تماچے اے ستم گئے نہ مار سکینہ کو تماچے ستم گئے احساس یتیمی بڑی سخت سزا ہے سجاد کو بے موت یہ غم مار گیا ہے اے شمرے لہیں کس پہ تو برساتا ہے کوڑے اے شمر لئی کس پہ تو برساتا ہے کوڑے عابد تو بری دیر سے بے ہوش پڑا ہے سجاد کو بے موت یہ غم مار گیا ہے شقوا نہیں زندہ سے کوئی بنت علی کو شقوا نہیں زندہ سے کوئی بیت علی کو کیا کم ہے کہ دیواروں نے پر داتوں کیا ہے سجاد کو بے موت یہ غم مار گیا ہے لو آگئی زندہ سے رہا ہو کے سکینہ لو 
गई जिंदा से रिहा हो के सकीना सहचाद के सीने से जो एक लाशा लगा है सहचाद को बेमौत ये हम मार गया है ध्रुव जी मोहम्मद Sigur, do I need that? Do I need that? أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين شفيع ذنوبنا وطبيب نفوسنا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم محمد وآله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وأصحابه المنتجبين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقدة من لساني يفقه قولي أما بعد السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الله سبحانه وتعالى to the eyes of Imam Al Hussein Salamullah Ali. Now Imam Hussein, like all his noble predecessors, and indeed all of humanity, was on a journey of his own, a personal journey of discovery, of finding, of becoming complete, of self-realization in his own human context. He had a special attachment with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and this personal journey was his journey. This is what we are going to examine. However, even in his personal journey, due to the shared humanness that we have with him, we can find traits that are there within Imam Hussein that can apply to us and maybe we can not only learn from them but we can relate to them and maybe in his own way grow to Allah in our own way grow towards Allah and seek assistance from his life. Imam Hussain Salamullah was a very different person to Imam Hassan. He was a very passionate person, whereas Imam Hassan was a very calm person. To the extent that Imam Hussain said to Bibi Zainab at one point that my brother Hassan was better than me. Imam Hussain, if we find, if we look at his early life, was very different to the Imam Hussein that we find on the plains of Karbala. But it was this unique personality of his that allows him to become what he became on the plains of Karbala, as if that unique trait of his prepared him for that task. Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim, when he struck Imam Ali down, and when Imam Ali died, Al Hassan took the sword in order to execute Abdul Rahman ibn Muljim. When Imam Hassan struck him, Imam Hussain said, Shall you not hand over the sword to me, that I too may strike at him and relieve my soul of the rage that it feels? 
So we find this thing in Imam Hussein, this sense of passion. Then, when Muawiyah came to Kufa, and he said, I did not wage a war against you, nor did I offer the truce, but to gain power over you. I did not have the intention of making you into better Muslims who pray or fast or give zakat. You did that in any case. I only wanted to seize power. And the truce that I've made with Al-Hassan is beneath my feet. Imam Hussein in a state of rage at that point stood. But Imam Hassan calmed him down and said, Restrain yourself, or to that effect. On another occasion, we find that Imam Hussein, after the death of Imam Hassan, would write and communicate his intention to stand against, Yazi, uh, against Muawiyah in his oppressive rule. And would often say that he would uphold the truth that Imam Hassan had made. But especially the khutbah that we find of Imam Hussein. At Mina, one year prior to his death, the sermon that he delivered to the ulama of Islam. It's a very powerful sermon, a very passionate sermon, in which he says to the ulama that you have made all of this possible. You have allowed their members to be occupied by people of Bani Umayyah who are ill-trained in Islam and who propagate whatever they want to propagate. He made the ulama a cause for the downfall of Islam and of righteousness. So we can see him very fearlessly displaying all these qualities. When we look at this side of Imam Hussein, we find that actually it was this passion, this want of truth, of establishing truth, this state of defiance that prepares Imam Hussein for the ultimate meeting with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in a way that only he could have met with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now people say that here, are we not going against the dictates of Islam? I will say no, Islam is totally misunderstood. We have these sort of false theologies in Islam that the first is Muhammad, the last is Muhammad, the middle is Muhammad, and all are Muhammad. And the naive audience, poor people understand that there is no difference between Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein. If there was no difference between Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein, then why would Imam Hassan tell Imam Hussein to calm, to acquire a state of calm, and Imam Hassan then instead give a very eloquent sermon? If they were the same. If they were the same, then what is the priority and the preference of Imam Ali over other Imams? If they were all the same, then why are Al Hassan and Hussein above every other Imam that comes after them? This is a naive understanding. Just like the prophets of God, none of them were the same. They were all very different. One was Kalim, one was Ruh, one was Khalil, one was Habib, one was Safi. There are no two things in this world that are the same. Everyone has their particular role to play and their personality traits best suit them to play that role. Especially the divine agents that we have amongst humanity, they had those personalities that enabled them to perform those roles. If you look at Isa, full of clemency and love, but that clemency and love would not have worked in delivering the Israelites from the Pharaoh and tolerating with them and putting up with them and taking them to the promised land. Moses had to be that person who had that anger and that rage inside him to be able to drive the cause of God where it needed to be. And Isa, on the other hand, had to have this clemency inside him and this softness. So Imam Hussein had this personality that makes him eligible to do what he did in the way that only he could do and nobody else. Now Imam Hussein's inner journey is made possible only through his unique relationship with God. And this unique relationship that Imam Hussein has with God as we will explore in these series of lectures is one of servitude and intimacy. And if we analyze it, we find that there are four or five stages of this beautiful relationship of servitude and intimacy with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we look at Imam Hussein's journey towards Karbala and his death, examine his supplications and the words 
with which he calls out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or his utterances on different occasions, we find very, very clearly that he himself is journeying and his relationship with God is acquiring greater and greater intimacy as he is progressing through his own journey with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every one of these sort of relationships that he has with Allah, we will see are sequentially placed. The first allows for the second to emerge. And when the second emerges, there is a greater level of godliness inside him, of self-realization. When I look into it, I think, in fact, we all have this. We can't realize it in the unique way in which Imam Hussein realized it, but we can realize it in our own unique way. The first relationship we observe <coughs> between Imam Hussein and his God is the relationship of state of indebtedness and humility to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We can express this further by different types of phrases, servant and master, slave and owner, bestower and bestowed upon, the powerful and the helpless, the giver and the indebted, the possessor and the one in dire poverty. At the commencement of his journey with God, he arrives at this point of deep-seated recognition of his helplessness in front of God. It's an amazing thing to understand. And in fact, if we were to understand this, a lot of our inner tribulations will give way to a lot of contentment because we will be able to satisfy ourselves. You see, when Akbar is taken from Hussein, Hussein Salamullah is not remorseful in the sense of being discontent at Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's not angry with God. He says to Allah instead, with the sentiment that he was yours, he was never mine. You have a prior right on him. As much as it hurts me, you have this right. And I cannot cross and transgress this line of questioning you and your decree, so on and so forth. If we can learn this state of Hussein, of indebtedness to God, and God is the bestower, and we have no claim of right upon God, life becomes far more easier to bear and far more meaningful. Now, as we go into this particular aspect of Hussein Salamullah Ali's relationship with Allah, we need to point out the understanding that Imam Hussein has from the core of the theology. And I want to explain this term slightly to put us in a better position as to what we mean. When we talk about Allah's full rights and having no claim upon Allah, look at the Quran. And we will see that we are making a mistake in understanding the Quran altogether. Allah says Allah is needless and you are in a state of dire need. Allah says he shall ask whatever he wants of whomsoever he wants but he shall not be asked. Allah says for Allah is everything within the heavens and the earth. He forgets, he forgives whoever he wants and he punishes whoever he wants. Allah says, Allah guides whomsoever he wants. Allah misguides whomsoever he wants. Now, if we look at these sentiments expressed by the Quran, the theologians have a problem. The Muslim theologians can't figure them out. So what do they say? They say, no, Allah will not misguide whoever he wants. And Allah will not guide whoever he wants. I will say, look out to your language. Allah will not. How can you say that about Allah? You can say, you can say that Allah, sorry, they said Allah, sorry, they say Allah cannot misguide whoever he wants and Allah cannot guide whoever he wants because that would be unjust. I'll say, how can you say that about God? You are taking the right of God away from God. It's another thing that Allah binds himself to certain protocols and he says, I will not. But how can you say Allah cannot? There's a huge difference. Because whenever we do not understand this principle, we feel a sense of right and claim upon God. I have done this, so I deserve paradise. 
Can you see this? What wrong did I do, O oh God, that you did this to me? This sentiment that we have is a sentiment that is alien to the essence of servitude. Hussein ibn Ali dispels this all together. Hussein ibn Ali does not understand this. He understands a different story altogether. He says, O oh Lord, you can forgive whoever you want. Imam Hussein says in one place, and I'll recount that in a little while, that, O oh Lord, grand is your mercy that it needs cause from you or a reason for you to be merciful. Without any reason from you, you are merciful. How can you then expect a reason from me for you to be merciful upon me? He denies this altogether. He says, if you're merciful upon me, then it's your favor, not because I deserve it. So here it is. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, and the theologians justify this, that Allah guides those who turn to him, and Allah misguides none, save those who are corrupt, the theologians offer this as a justification for God. But God goes beyond, and Allah says, no. I can guide whoever I want, and I can misguide whoever I want without any qualifications. Allah says, for me is the heavens and the earth. I can forgive who I want, and I can punish who I want. I can ask whatever I want, and nobody shall ask me regarding my decision. The reason why these verses have come in is for us to be humbled before God. Because otherwise we will always feel that we have this sense of right upon God. And that God, you cannot do this because I've done this. And this, Imam Hussein says, is inconsistent to the spirit of servitude. It is no right of mine. It is your right, God. No matter how much good I do, you can punish me if you want to. Oh Lord, you can misguide me and nobody will ask you anything. These verses are there to humble the human soul. Least we are entrapped like Iblis was entrapped. Because Iblis felt a sense of claim over God. A sense of right. Iblis said, how God can you give him preference over me when I have spent a lifetime worshipping you? Iblis has this sense of right inside his soul. Hussein says, no, there is no sense of right that I have and no claim. I do not have any claim over God. Now for those who have experienced these moments of death, they will know or read up on this, that when we die, there is a total state of helplessness. We are totally behoven to the discretion of God and His mercy. We feel in a state of nothingness. That state of nothingness is the truest first step in devotion to God and in relationship with God that, O oh Lord, I have no claim over you. No good deed means anything. It is only you and your right and your mercy. So Hussein ibn Ali alayhi says so beautifully, Alhamdulillah, laysa li qadaihi dafiq. Praise be to Allah. Nothing can avert his decree. Whatever he decrees will happen. The state of helplessness. Wa laysa li ataihi maniq. Nothing can prevent the good that he is giving from coming to us. He elevates us in, his, in, in our ranks and he abases all the tyrants. This is how powerful Allah is. And he is upon everything, all capable. He can do whatever he wants and it will happen. Ilahi, hukmuka nafid. O Lord, your decision is final. وَمَشِيَّتُكَ قَاهِرٌ And your will overpowers every single thing. In this relationship then, when he looks at Allah, he says to Allah, O oh Allah, you are the bestower. When you bestow, you do not bestow due to eligibility from me. You bestow in accordance with your own self. So he says, O oh Lord, you created me, fashioned me, gave me limbs, organs. Within darkness of the womb, you fed me, you looked after me. Within pure wombs, did you accommodate me? You brought me into a merciful lap. You bestowed me with loving parents. You fed me 
with wholesome sustenance. Before the rising of the sun, before my coming into this world, you ensured that the sun arose. You ensured that the earth produced. You ensured that I was fed. You gave me a physical body that functions so well with all its intricate connections. Oh Lord, you brought me into your religion. You allowed me to take birth at the time of the best of your creatures. You did not need to do any of that. You have done all of that as a favor upon me. There was no eligibility from me. What is he trying to say here? That, O oh Lord, had you wanted, you could have made me a cripple. Had you wanted, you could have brought me into a household of your enemies. Had you wanted, I could have taken birth in a different religion. Had you wanted, I would have been born in a state of tyranny and oppression. But it was you who chose to do this. In all of this, it was your bestowal upon me. Now he feels a state of debt to God. Not only do I not have a claim over you, O God, but you have favors upon me. Now he looks at this relationship and it deepens inside him. And he says, O oh Lord, how do I begin to thank you for all that you have done for me? When every act of giving thanks requires a function of what you have already bestowed upon me, it is as if every act of giving thanks physically requires so much physical movement of my mouth, my jaw, my tongue, my lungs, my vocal cord, that one act of giving thanks causes me to become indebted a thousand times over. Oh Lord, it is an impossible task to thank you. And then he says, Oh Lord, if the physical act of giving thanks to you is an impossibility and makes me further indebted to you, then what can I say of the tawfiq and the good sense that you give me to thank you in the first place that you may not have given anybody else? So he says, Oh Lord, it is an impossible task to thank you. Then he looks at himself. And he says, O oh Lord, and if I were to thank you, then how should I thank you? With the hands that you bestowed to me, that you gave me so freely, and with which I have disobeyed you? With the legs that you gave me, as a mercy and a bestowal, and with which I have gone to places displeasing to you? With the eyes that you gave, with which I have disobeyed you? the ears that are your favor and your trust and your amanat with which I have heard things that were displeasing to you with the tongue that you bestowed to me and with which I have spoken things that are not liked by you. He then recounts these beautiful steps of him reasoning and coming to this full state of indebtedness. And says, O oh Lord, this is my state. Nothingness in front of you. Even if I talk, what should I say? Even if I thank you, how may I thank you? It is as if he stands at the threshold of death and witnesses that great majesty of God. Now we go a step back. And we look at the Prophet of Allah. The Quran says he used to stand at nights. And it's, his feet used to swell up. And Allah says, stand at night but a little. I know you and a number of the mu'mineen stand with you. And I know you feel tired, so rest a little but do stand instead. Allah insists that the Prophet stood. <coughs> Lady Aisha comes to the Prophet. And she said, why, O oh Messenger of God, do you have to plead to Allah in this way? لَقَدْ غَفَرَ لَكَ اللَّهَ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِن ذَنْبِكْ وَمَا تَأَخَّرْ Allah has indeed forgiven you whatever has gone of your sin and whatever has remained. The Prophet Muhammad said, Awalam akun abdan shakura. Aisha, should I not be a thankful servant of Allah? What he was trying to say was that it is a state of debt upon me. And I need to acknowledge that debt. I can't pay it back, but I need to acknowledge my bestower in a state of need towards him in a state of acknowledging my state 
of nothingness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we say that the Prophet is the greatest of person and deserves this and deserves that, we almost take it to the level of Prophet of God having a favor on God. Whereas if you look at the sentiment of the Prophet of God, he says, God has had favor on me. It's amazing the way these people see. So under the blade, Hussein does not see himself having a favor upon Allah. He sees the blade as the favor of Allah upon his neck. That, oh Lord, you have allowed this for me to bear for your love. You have not bestowed anybody else with this gift. How wonderfully we find the poem, the, poem, um, the poet depicting this scene. That Zainul Abidin is enchained and being dragged. And he says to Zainul Abidin, but you are the light of God. The grandson of the messenger. What is all this? Chains around your hands and yoke around your neck. And being dragged. He said, oh man, these are the ornaments of the love of God. So this is the state of indebtedness that they see towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now let us take this further. In his final supplication and prayer, this is what Hussein's words were. Allahumma anta muta'aliyul makan. O Allah, raised are you in your station. Qadimul jabarut, lofty in your grandeur. Shadidul mihal, sturdy in your position. Ghaniyun anil khalaiq. Free from need of your creation. Adi aridul kibriya. Vast in your pride or grand in your pride. Qadirun ala ma tasha. All capable over whatever you want. Muhitum bima khalaqt. You surround everything that you have created. Qadirun ala ma arat. You are capable or capable of doing whatever you want. Mudrikun ma talabt. You will conquer whatever you seek. So beautifully he depicts this particular sentiment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, Qareebun Mujib, you are near and you respond. You see all affairs. So this is the way in which Hussein ibn Ali is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now when we look at Hussein ibn Ali, we find that the sort of tribulations that he faces are so difficult. But in this difficulty, what assists him is this relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Can you imagine going to your son who is rubbing his heels and you find a dagger embedded deep within his chest? He sees his son, and this is no way easy. He says, what makes this bearable, O child, is that Allah witnesses this, and that Allah preserves every soul with whatever it has done. You find that when Zainab says to him, but why do you leave me? He says, my father, my grandfather, my father, my brother were all better than me, yet death did not spare any of them. We belong to God and we are his claim. No one can stand before him. These are the sentiments inside him that allow him to go on. But I suppose the truest difficulty for Hussein ibn Ali is what he saw of the grief of others around him. So for example, when we see Lady Zainab coming to him and crying and pleading with him, he says, Oh sister, do not tear the arteries of my heart through your tears. Bear it for the sake of Allah. Your grief shall know no end, but be sure to know that Allah witnesses all that is happening to you and he shall punish your enemies and he will give you endless rewards in return for the griefs that you bear. However, there are moments in Hussein's life in Karbala and on the day of Ashura where this great mountain of resolve himself crumbles. And in the most 
unlikely sort of moments. Hamid ibn Muslim says that he emerged from his tent for the final time. He went towards his steed. The wind of the desert blew to an extent that I witnessed the hem of his garment blowing from side to side. As he was approaching his steed, the cloth of the tent lifted, and a child of three or four emerged. She, with trembling legs, walked behind him. She reached him, and she pulled at the hem of his garment. He turned around, and the little voice rose, and she said, Oh, Father, look at me. I am dying of thirst. Hamid said, Hussein shook, and he cried. As tears poured from his eyes, in a state of helplessness, he placed his hand upon the head of the child. And he said, O oh child, may Allah quench your thirst. I have narrated this, and I will continue with this narration, that the child was merely three or four. And of course, as children are, we conflate the narration of Lady Sakina and Lady Rukayya when we read. But this is a child of three or four. And children forget after they sleep. So on the next day, this little child said, where is my father? They placed her upon the chest of a headless body. She slept and fell asleep. She felt that comfort of the chest of her father. When the women were ordered to leave, they parted from the bodies of the dead. Zainab hesitated. And the whip descended upon her. She cried out and left, but the child was asleep. And the next whip falls upon the tender back. And she cries out, confused and not knowing what is happening. Throughout her ordeal, she is constantly asking, where is my father? Where is my uncle? Where are my brothers? They come into the ruins. At times she forgets. At times she asks. They told her, your father has gone with your brothers and your uncle. It's some business and they will come back. So once she witnessed some birds coming. She noticed that the birds were coming to the ruins in the morning and going away in the evening. So she asked her mother or her aunt, where do they come from and where do they go? So they said, they come to seek food for their young. And at night they fly away back to their children. So she said, where is my father? Why doesn't my father come back to me? This thought of her father prevails upon her heart. She finds no rest on that night. She sees her father in a dream, awakens not knowing a difference between dream and wakefulness. She cries out, I saw my father, where is my father? They say, take this, O child. She removes the handkerchief. And she says, who is this? She doesn't recognize her father. It's a cut head, a wounded. Who is this? I ask for my father. Child, it is your father. And she recognizes her father. And she cries out aloud. And then they see her face on the face of her father. She falls silent. They say, awaken, O Sakina, only to find that she has gone to her father. Allah la'natullah al-qawmi al-dhalimeen wa sayya'alamu al-ladhina thalamu wa yamun qalabi yanqalibun ilahi inna nasaluka bi haqqi al-Husayn wa jaddihi wa bi 
وأمه وأخيه وتسعة المعصومين من ذريته وبني اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا وكفر عنا سيئاتنا وتبفنا مع الأبرار اللهم عجل فرج إمامنا المنتظر واجعلنا من أنصاره وعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه We will have a surah fatiha and after that Q&A al-fatiha से गुजरेगी कैसे जैनब बाजार शाम से वाकिफ नहीं है बीबी वाकिफ नहीं है बीबी बलवाए आम से गुजरेगी कैसे जैनब बाजार शाम से अहमद की है नवासियाँ सजाद कह रहे हैं सालार काफिला जो सो जख्म से रहे हैं लोगों न मारो पाथर लोगों न मारो पाथर हर एक मकाम से गुजरेंगी कैसे जैनब बाजार शाम से गुजरेंगी कैसे जैनब शाम से जिसको सलाम खुद ही अल्लाह कर रहे हैं उस बीबिया पे जाल ये जुल्म डार है हैं महरूम कर दिया है महरूम कर दिया है उनको सलाम से गुजरेगी कैसे जैनब बाजार शाम से गुजरेगी कैसे जैनब शाम गरीबों में जैन अब बन गई थी गाजी है आज तक इमामत बाकी जकत उनकी आबिद को जा के लाई आबिद को जा के लाई जलते खयाम से गुजरेगी कैसे जैनब शाम से गुजरेगी कैसे जैनब बाजार जहरा की सानी जैनब बाजार में खरी है चादर नहीं है सर पे गैरत भी रो रही है है हाथ और गर्दन है हाथ और गर्दन बंदे लगाब से गुजरेगी कैसे जैनब गुजरेगी कैसे जैब 
بازار شام سے محمد والا محمد سلوات توجہ جا صلی اللہ علیکہ یا ابا عبداللہ وعلا الرواح اللہ حلت بفنائک علیکہ منی صلاب اللہ ابدا ما بقیت و بقی اللیل و النہار ولا جعله الله آخر الأحد مني لزيارتكم السلام على الحسين وعلى علي بن الحسين وعلى أولاد الحسين وعلى أسحاب الحسين جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا غريب الغرب وبعيد المدى سلطان بن الحسن مولانا علي بن موسى الرضا كن شفيعنا وشفيع والدينا في يوم الجزاء ورحمة الله وبركاته السلام عليك يا حجة الله يا ابن الحسن يا صاحب الأسر والزمان السلام عليك يا خليفة الرحمن السلام عليك يا شريك القرآن السلام عليك يا كعبة الإيمان السلام عليك يا إمامنا وإمام الإنس والجان أعجل الله تعالى فرجك وصحر الله مخرجك وظهورك وجعلنا الله من أنسارك وأعوانك والمستشهدين بين يديك السلام عليكم جميعا ورحمة الله وبركاته Raise your hand and the mic will be passed to you. Assalamu alaikum. Waalaikum assalam. First of all, thank you very much for today. Uh, one of the things that we do come across a lot on the day of Ashura is a poetry between, which is a dialogue between the angel of death and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the last bit of it says that, the angel of death says that the, well the explanation comes to it which I was in, which I heard in Dar Islam, was that the level of spirituality between Imam Hussein and his Lord was at its peak, that nothing could come between it. Now first of all, did, is that, does that come from a strong chain of narration? And if it does, and if it did, then why only limit to Imam Hussein when the Prophet, I think, well, it's obvious that his spiritual level is That's higher. fine. That, absolutely fine. So these are what you call poetic sort of depictions of what is happening in the spiritual realm. Right? We take license as well. However, however, the Quran actually does make this distinction. So whatever the poetry says, for the purpose of lamentation and to arouse our sentiment. Of course, nobody knows what conversation took place or if indeed any conversation took place or not, yes? It's not from a chain of narration or anything strong or whatever. However, the Quran does say, yes, that there is an angel of death that takes the souls, yes? And the Quran does say there are other agencies like the angels who take soul. So here we're looking at a, categ uh, a sense of hierarchy of human souls, that those who are very low will be visited by angels of chastisement, they will take their soul. Those that are good will be visited by angels who are good and will take their soul. However, some of the angels, some of the souls will be visited by the angel of death, who is a very superior and supreme being. Now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also says that he is the one who takes the souls. So there are certain souls that Allah says He takes. Yes? So the Quran does make that distinction. So when you look at this, you think, yes, it's quite possible. It's a depiction, of course, of a possible scenario that might have happened, but it's there to just arouse emotions. But it has some sense of truth in there as well. Now, Allah says, furthermore, within the Quran, do not consider those slain in the way of Allah as dead, they are alive. In Tafsir Safi, Faith Ghashani quotes that the people who are shohada, their spirit is not taken out of their body to the level to which an ordinary person dying spirit is taken out. So the angel of death might not have much place when it comes to somebody dying through martyrdom. Yes? So when you put it all together, it's, yes, it makes a lot of sense. 
Of course, this is just somebody writing it, but in essence it makes a lot of sense, according to the Quran. I had a question actually regarding, you know in your lecture you spoke, uh, you said Bibi Sakina, then you, you also said Bibi Rukeya. I know in a, I've, and I think it was in another lecture that I heard as well, a lot of speakers refer to Bibi Sakina and Bibi Rukeya as the same person. But I've been to other lectures where they've spoke about them being different people and obviously Imam Hussein having three daughters, one being Bibi Sakina, Bibi Rukeya, and I'm not sure if the third daughter. So could you clarify, is it the same person or are they two different No, daughters? Lady Rukeya is the youngest one. Bibi Sakina is slightly older, about eight or nine, because Allah, the Imam says, Sakina, you are the best of women to cry for me. So you don't say to a child, you are the best of women to cry for me, yes? Because Sakina, salamu alayha, would approach Imam Hussein and say, where is my brother? And she would say, well, why should I not despair when my brother has been killed and my father has no helper? So Lady Sakina is the older one. Bibi Rukaya is the younger one. But because we do not really have time to sort these things out in public and in sort of lectures, so what we do is we tend to resort in our oratory towards the Masai part to both of Lady Sakina and Bibi Rukeya's narrations and we conflate them into one. There is a need for historians and scholars to come and to explain to us that this is Lady Sakina and this is Lady Rukeya and so that our ears can become acquainted with different names and then we can uh, you know, put different narrations. So for example, you will not find a very mature, meaningful conversation being had by a three or four year old with her father to the level to which we hear Bibi Sakina and Imam Hussein talking, yes? On many occasions you will think, how can this conversation take place between a four year old and a father? So you know that is Lady, Lady Sakina speaking there. And at other instances, uh, for example, when, when the horse of Imam Hussein comes and Lady Sakina cries out, did they quench my father's thirst? Or did they put him to death. She said, tell me where my father is and I'll give you the reward of heavens and earth. A child does not say that. So this is Lady Sakina, yes? And then again, the whole issue of the marriage of the daughter of Imam Hussein with the son of Imam Hassan. Well, we also have that riwayah that not Hazrat Qasim, but Hassan Muthanna. Imam Hussein married his daughter off to Hassan Muthanna in Karbala in order to protect her. And out of the seven children of Imam Hassan, he was the only one who lived. He was presumed dead, but then they found that he's still breathing. They did not behead him because there were people of his clan on Yazid's side of the army. So they asked Umar ibn Sa'd to let him live and they nursed him and then he gained uh, in health and then he was frightened to know that Imam Hussein had been killed. So a lot of these things are there that require clarification. Yeah. But Sakina, Salamu Ali and Rukaya were two different people. Bibi Sakina. Oh, so That's Bibi Sakina. So she had children as well. Yeah. yeah. But Bibi Rukaya, no, the, 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 there were two, and one was married to Imam Hassan's son in Medina, according to Mufid, and Imam Hassan's son had died. So she stayed by his grave. There were two. Two sisters, yes. So the Shahada we said, is it Rukaya? Rukaya. Lady Rukaya. Yeah, I mean, some ulama have offered the sort of explanation that since he used to call his sons Ali, 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 yes? So it's quite possible that he called his daughters Sukaina or Sakina, older one, and the diminutive noun Sukaina as the younger Sakina. Can you see that? So he might have called older one Sakina and the younger one Sukaina, because Sukaina means the little peace-giving factor because he was the contentment of his heart. So it's quite possible these scholars are saying that he used to call both of them Sakina or Sakina and Sukaina. Rukaya, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the one that we visit commonly. Yeah, yeah. But then in the Bab Sahir graveyard, they allege that maybe Sakina's grave is there. The other one. The older one, yeah. Sakina Rukaya is, I think, is the only title all they name Fatima. 
Yeah, you're right. That's right. That's right. Sons Ali and daughters Fatima. That's right. That's right. That's right. We have an online question. Yeah. Sorry, it's just opening up. Would every imam have carried out the same actions in the circumstance that they were in? Or is it more accurate to say that each imam would act differently dependent on their personality? If the imams had no option but one righteous course, which is absolutely right, then obviously they would all do the same thing. So there are certain stages in which we see that no, no two imams or prophet and imam would have acted differently. When it comes to the absolute black and white and red lines, yes? When it comes to the absolute red lines, no two prophets or no prophet and imam would act differently. They would act in the same way. But when there are a variety of routes to remedy a particular situation, then they would most likely act differently in accordance with their own dispositions. Yeah? Any other questions? Assalamu alaikum. <laughs> I was recently having a chat with my aunt where we had a conversation and I was stuck in terms of how to go forward in terms of explanation regarding the tragedy of Karbala. Um, we've heard for years and I have no doubt that there was a religious standpoint behind Karbala itself. However, the question that I was raised was if it was really religious, then why did Imam Ali act differently when his position was taken from him? Why did Imam Hassan act differently or the other Imams when their right was taken from them? Why is it that they acted so differently to Imam Hussain? Was there a political viewpoint as well? So if you look at Imam Hassan, uh, sorry, Imam Ali, what did Imam Ali say? He said, I was left with an op option of retrieving my right with arms that were severed. In that, I saw that endurance was better. So he is now giving the explanation that at that point I could have fought, but my arms were severed, to mean that I did not really have support. And two, it would have actually introduced the culture of civil war from straight after the demise of the Prophet. So Imam Ali also is assessing the situation of the community and seeing its outreaching consequences, far-reaching consequences. And that is why he says to Lady Aisha that you do not know what you are doing. What you are doing today at the Battle of Jamal will have consequences upon the Muslim community till the end of times. You know, today we have the sectarianism and strife, civil strife and uh, battles amongst the Muslims and what. It's all stemming from our own history and our own theology. Had our theology been cemented in the notion of the sacredness of Muslim and Muslim fraternity, we would have been less inclined to kill each other as we are today. So Imam Ali's reasoning was that. If you look at Imam Hassan, his reasoning was several. One is, he said, had I not done this, the people for whose sake Allah bestows upon the world would not have been left on the face of this earth. Yes? The good souls would have all been taken away. That's the first reason he gives. The second reason is there, we are told that the truth and falsehood would not have become distinguished. Because Al Hassan Al Hussein would have been killed, overcome in battle, because of you, you saw the treason and everything happening in the time of Imam Hassan, and nobody would have known the true face of Bani Umayyah. And three, although Muawiyah was bestowing lavishly upon the Roman Empire, the emperor, to keep him at bay and not attacking Syria, if a civil war would have broken out, Imam Hassan's side 40,000 and Muawiyah's side 40, 50,000, because the Muslims, when the Romans had their wars, the Muslims always seized the opportunity to walk into their lands and take them, like Syria was taken from them. So had there broken out a civil war within the folds of Islam, they could have easily also have taken Muslim lands. So this was the sort of reasoning behind the acceptance of truce by Imam Hassan Salamullah Imam Hussein makes his reasons very clear. He says, now this person is demanding pledge of allegiance from me. 
Allah does not allow me, the messenger does not allow me, and the mu'mineen do not allow me. Why? Because he understood that pledging allegiance to the like of Yazid was to condone Yazid's reign. And because in the minds of the people, who are very naive, they could not distinguish between Khilafa, which was temporal leadership of the world, and spiritual leadership, which is known as Imama. They used to conflate Khilafa and spiritual leadership in one. So whatever Yazid would do, would become Islam, and with Hussein's Bay'ah, it then stamps it. So Imam said, the likes of me can never do Bay'ah of the likes of him. Now, the Imam said, I refuse to do Bay'ah. But I will not initiate the war. Yes? So you find Imam Hussein saying, like Imam Ali before him, that do not, to Hazrat Abbas, do not mount the first attack. Do not shoot the first arrow. And Umar Ibn Sa'ad comes and he says to everybody, bear witness, I shoot the first arrow and I commence the battle. So Imam Hussein did not fight, he defended. He defended his rights, his freedom his autonomy and his liberty that I will not pay allegiance to a corrupt leader and due to me not paying allegiance you are waging a war against me and I will save myself in the process so there were three different re reasons given yeah does that make it easier <coughs> sorry to an extent okay training future scholars of religion <laughs> in cutting-edge research and translations as well as a wide range of outreach activities as a means of sharing the human face of Islam and the message of Ahlul Bayt. As a grassroots from the organization, you are all welcome to donate to the Institute in whatever capacity you can to allow the Institute to continue its activities. The donation box will be outside the chapel on the table um, where you can donate. You will be, if you would like to hear more about our activities, you can also sign, sign up to our mailing list, the very long table as well outside, where our recent uh, publications are also available for sale at special discounted rates. So, tomorrow's mind list will be starting slightly earlier at 7.30. The work made recitation, recitation of the Holy Quran, the um, Masya, Lecture by Sheikh Ali, Matam, Ziara, Kyrne, and Nias. Finally, please can I ask you all to recite Surah Fatiha for all the Mahmoud.